Hi guys, happy Tuesday. Um, like usual, I'm coming live on here to give you a training regarding your, your content and basically how to get um, more clients from your content as far as um, strategy or mindset or whatever it is. Sorry, I'm in a co-working space, so if you open the hall, my door is this thin so you can hear everything. Anyways, hi, it's Tuesday. I'm glad you're here with me. Uh, today I'm talking about um, the feelings of being slimy with sales. Now this is coming from someone who has no sales background before my business. Um, it wasn't something that, you know, pulled me into it's something I had to learn from scratch and deal with on a mental level. I know that sales can be a difficult thing, especially if you're someone who, you know, you started your business and you're so excited, I'm going to do bookkeeping, I'm going to do writing. And then you go to start your business and you're like, oh my God, now I have to be a salesman. And you're like, I started this job so I could do more of what I wanted. Now I have to sell, my, sell myself. And then you have to learn this new skill and deal with all of these like hangups with it. So this is, I really want to help you walk through like the mindset of it, how to change it from being a, um, a slimy process to something that's more serving. I know that's something you guys have probably heard before, um, but I still want to walk through it as someone who has had to walk through it step by step by myself <laughs> and as someone who is still struggling with this because, um, you know, imposter syndrome, all those things. So anyways, I'm going to cover the difference between a slimy salesman and a serving salesman. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, five sales mindset anchors that help me when I remember to sit down and go through them and three sales content tactics you can use in your content, like what they are, how they work, and again, how to use them in a way that feels good. When it comes to sales, I'm very, I'm very careful about making sure that the sale feels good to me in the conversations, interacting with people, things of that nature. So this is all about how to make sales feel good, how to reframe it in a way where you know that you're serving instead of selling and how to behave in a certain way and how it affects your content. Okay, anyways, so we're gonna go with this fun alliteration. So this is four attributes of a slimy salesman versus a serving salesman. We got all the S's I'm gonna, ha I'm gonna <laughs> be slithering for the next few minutes. Okay, so a slimy salesman manipulates, is dishonest, is annoying, and is pushy. However, a serving salesman, instead of manipulating, they acclimate. Instead of being dishonest, they're honest. Instead of being annoying, they're pleasant. And instead of being pushy, they're persistent. So I'll go through this one by one really quick. Again, when you think of a salesman, you think of someone who's a used car dealer, right? Someone who's trying to get the sale, push you into doing something just for him. So, but there's a way to flip these around. Um, so the slimy salesman, he manipulates you. He pushes you to his agenda, his timeline. How can I get this person to do what I want to do? And he doesn't take the client's good into his account. So that's a slimy salesman. He's manipulating the situation so that you do what he wants. He doesn't care what's good for you. The serving salesman acclimates. So, um, so what is acclimating? Of course, you become accustomed to a new climate or to new conditions. So when you acclimate to someone else, you're getting in their world, their shoes, their needs. If you're manipulating, you don't care. If you're acclimating, you are getting into their world. What do they actually need? Um, there's an article I came across that I really liked, and it says leading means helping people do what they want, not what they don't want. Um, you're not trying to manipulate people. You're trying to figure out where they are in their world and how you can help them. Um, so how what does, acclim what does acclimating look like in your copy, in your business? Honestly, it's asking questions. Um, you know, this can be asking questions of them. It could be asking questions in your group. It could be doing research. What are these people curious about? And you follow that question into research. What do bookkeepers struggle with? What, do, what does this particular type of small business struggle with? Um, get in their world. Find out what they really want or need. And that's something that happens a lot on like my sales calls. So someone will call in and they're convinced I need a website and I need it so I can get more clients regularly and quickly. Um, they don't tell me that right up front, but in asking them questions, what are your goals? What are you trying to do? What do you want to accomplish? Then I realize there's a mismatch. They think that having a website will turn to a bunch of clients for them quickly. And so I'm able to, once I get in their world and acclimate to them, like, okay, you're trying to reach X goal, but you're not picking the right method to get there. Here's what I suggest. And so sometimes I'll suggest even a cheaper service if I feel like it's better for them. And not only that, sometimes I'll refer them to someone else. I'm not a good match for you, but I know someone who could be to help you with that need. Um, so that's what acclimating looks like. You are getting into their world, meeting their needs. That's what a good salesperson does. They're trying to fix the problem that they actually feel. 
So number number two, um, a slimy salesman, he's dishonest. He lies, shares untrue results, unbelievable or inflated claims, fake testimonials, all those things. So a slimy salesman is dishonest. But the serving salesman, see lots of lots of hissing like a snake, <laughs> um, is honest. So what does it look like to be honest in your business, in your sales? Well, honestly, like, you know, the easiest way to do it, share testimonials, share client results. Um, you know, if they got great results, great. Show them what it is, don't be embarrassed. If you did something awesome for someone, share that you did something awesome. Tell these other people, this is how I help them and how I can help you. Um, also, another part of being honest, address potential objections, okay? Uh, so something that happens is I offer template services. So uh, one question that I hear a lot from people is, well, are other people overlapping posts? And so when I talk about my template services, I'm honest, I'm ready for it. I don't want them to feel like I'm skirting around the issue because it's true, it's a template service, but I talk through the benefits as well. You're right, there is a possibility of that, and it does happen sometimes. However, audiences don't overlap as much, templates are a common way of, um, of, uh, of, of putting out recurring content, think of like an email subscription list, things like that. But yes, the content can overlap. So you address the potential objections, you're honest about it, because here's the good thing, you don't have to worry about being too perfect, this is another part of being honest. If you look too good to be true, it sends off little alarm bells. So if you're trying to come across as too perfect, too polished, it's suspicious to us. So it's okay to be a little bit raw on the edges sometimes because it's like, oh, this is, an, this, is, this is true life. True life involves some, some rough edges. So that's how you can be honest as a serving salesman. This is the true benefits, these are the true objections, and things of that nature. Instead of trying to shield or be dishonest about what's going on. Okay, so another thing. An annoying salesman is slimy. Or a, sal a slimy salesman is annoying. Let's get that turned around. Um, uh, a serving salesman is pleasant, okay? So the best analogy I have for this is think about um, going to a networking event, people you don't really know, or you're going to a Christmas party that your spouse invited you along with. You're in a room full of strangers that you have to make small talk with. I want you to picture two different people. One of those strangers comes up to you and does nothing but talk about himself, his big boat, his, his job, his lifestyle, or even on the opposite end of the spectrum. He could be talking about um, living with his mother, his business never took off, and does nothing but, but complain. All he does is talk about himself. That's a direct, right? But think of another kind of person at that party. Someone who asks you questions, um, expresses genuine interest, asks follow-up questions. Um, and you have a conversation going back and forth. He showed genuine interest in you. Who are you going to be uh, most attracted to, want to follow up with, keep working with? Um, you're going to want to keep working with someone who's interested in you, who's pleasant. And I love this quote from Dale Carnegie. He has that famous book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And he says, you can make more friends in two months by becoming interested in other people than you can in two years by trying to get other people interested in you ask about other people, get them to talk about themselves. People love talking about themselves. And guess what? From a sales perspective, not only is it good for relational perspective, but the more people talk about themselves, the more you get to know what they're actually dealing with. Again, this is part of like uh, acclimatizing to where they're at, what they actually need. Ask questions, talk to them, because that's where, um, that's where the good stuff will come from. Um, that's where you'll be able to understand specifically how you can help this specific person instead of just a canned offering or a canned pitch. So be pleasant, listen, talk to them about them. So that's three. And then number four, a slimy salesman is pushy, but a serving salesman is persistent. Now it's hard because sometimes there's a fine line to draw, so I get that. But if someone is pushy, they're impatient. They want you to do things on their timeline. You see there's like there's patterns through all of this. Um, on their timeline. They cut right to the sales pitch without getting to know you or what you're dealing with. Um, they try to push a close on their terms and timeline. Honestly, they act like a needy ex-girlfriend and are blowing up your phone, your email, whatever. You don't want to deal with the needy ex-girlfriend. However, you do need to be persistent. And there is a way to be persistent in a good way. Because um, persistence basically means you're putting the offer out there, but you know that they have to make the decision. The choice is ultimately theirs. However, something important to keep in mind when it comes to sales, um, the odds of you talking to a person and then buying in the first conversation is about zip. 
it can happen. It's a freaking nature. Um, what is more common is having to touch base with them or have them interact with your com content at least five times before they're ready to open their wallet. So there is a way that there is a need to be persistent to stay in the world to keep talking to them without being pushy, without being icky. So there's really good ways to do this. There's stuff that I've been using in my business. Um, here's something to keep in mind as far as a mindset when it comes to being persistent and following up with someone that didn't buy the first time that you know they talked to you. Unless they explicitly said otherwise, assume that they're interested in working with you. They just got busy. I mean, think about how many things you have to do all day long, how many notifications you get in your phone in a single hour. We get busy, we get distracted. Just because I don't follow up something right away doesn't mean I'm not interested in something, right? So assume that, assume that first unless they say differently and space out your follow-ups. Don't just send them a barrage of emails for the next two days because your month end is coming and you need to make a, a quota. Space it out. Again, be persistent by being there when they're ready for it. Staying top of mind, but not shoving them on your timeline. So tracking and scheduling your follow-ups. This is actually something that I do and I'm always trying to get better at because I'm not perfect at it. Um, I use ClickUp for this. Um, I've used Trello and spreadsheets. Honestly, it's showing that I'm remembering them, especially if I follow up in a way where they said, I'll be ready now, but maybe in a month. So I set a reminder for a month from now, and I follow up, I'm like, hey, you and I talked about the website. I just didn't know if you're in that place yet. If you need help, let me know. If not, I'm sure there's other ways I can re refer you to someone, things of that nature. And that shows that I'm thinking of them, right? I think of it as like, you know, you, you put a reminder in your phone for your mom's birthday. Um, just to make sure you remember. It's kind of like that, but it makes sure that you're able to be thoughtful. It's a relational touch point. Um, it's just kind of being responsible for your relationships. Another one I really like, a value added follow up. So say someone talks a lot about, you know, they really love beagles. They have three beagles in their home, and but they don't, they're not ready to buy quite yet. So say a week later, you come across an article or a video full of cute beagles. So you send it to them, like, hey, I saw this, I was thinking of you, how are you doing? I thought this was super cute. You're sending them something entertaining. Um, or if, um, you know, you could do something like a small tip thing related to something they were struggling with, like, hey, I remember you're saying you were having a hard time keeping up with clients, I came across this great article, thought that he, thought of you, maybe it could help you, um, hope you're doing well, things of that nature. You're giving them something, you're not just checking in and saying, what's up, have you thought about the offer? Again, you're giving them something more, you're adding more value to the relationship, you're softening it up. And if they're, they're not ready, or not interested, respect their wishes, leave them be. One good way to handle it is like, you can send just like a friendly breakup email. Um, just, you know, like, okay, I know that you're not interested right now, that's totally fine. Um, here's something else that may help you as far as a resource and here's my contact information if you ever want to move forward on this and I can help you just let me know I'd love to help you and that way it's just like it's it's closing the door it's letting them go because again not everyone you talk to no matter how persuasive you are will be ready to buy or want to buy that's okay let it go move on to the next one but don't be afraid to be persistent and to follow up so that's the difference so just to recap um, don't manipulate but acclimate to them um, you don't have to be dishonest. You can be honest about your results and like, you know, the potential imperfections. Um, you don't want to be annoying. You can be pleasant and as easy as asking them about themselves. People love to talk about themselves. And uh, you don't have to be pushy, but you can be persistent. You're allowed to be persistent. You can, and just make sure that you personalize it when you do and you're spacing it out. Don't be like a crazy ex-girlfriend. Okay, so that's how I want to reframe a salesman. Now, I want to talk about some mindset anchors when it comes to your sales. Again, this is all stuff I've had to build and deal with myself because I started out with zero experience. I'm not a natural salesperson. This has been a lot of <laughs> work building this up for me brick by brick. So if you feel like you're also not a natural person, these may help you. Um, so I have five of them. The first one is, I know that my services make a positive difference in the lives of others. I know that my services make a positive difference in the lives of others. Um, so you really have to believe in your services and yourself. If you don't, why will a customer buy from you? You can work on it. Again, like I said, I've done tons of work on this. Oh, tapping meditations, books, the whole nine yards. It can be improved. But if it's lacking, it's going to be hard for you to sell yourself. Um, uh, da, 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 yeah. So... 
you're making a diff positive difference in the lives of others. Okay, number two. There are people out there whose lives will be improved by what I have to offer. There are people out there whose lives will be improved by what I have to offer. Okay, now you believe that what you do makes a difference. Now you can believe that there are people out there who genuinely want what you do, that you are making a positive difference. There is a group of people out there who want to go from A to B, or achieve X or avoid Y, and you can help them get there faster, more comfortably, enjoy it more. You give something positive to their life by what you offer. Those people are out there. So number three, the positive difference I make has a monetary value that people expect to pay for. So this is an, was an important one for me. So the positive difference I make has a monetary value that people expect and are willing to pay for. So let's say you go to Target, you know, you dangerously wander in for a 10 minute trip and you walk out 45 minutes later with a cart full of clothes. Are you surprised when Target asks you to pay for the clothes at the checkout? You understand that getting new clothes has a cost, right? Okay, what about um, you go to a really nice restaurant? You eat a great big beautiful meal from a gourmet chef. Are you surprised when they bring a check at the end? No, you're not, because eating a well-made meal that you didn't make and you didn't have to wash the dishes for, right? It has a cost. We understand that. We understand that people's effort, expertise, and time has a cost. And so your effort, expertise, and time also has cost, has monetary value. We expect things and services to have value. So if you're doing or creating something that puts the buyer in a better situation, enjoyment, you know, tax ready, all of those things. If you're doing that, you have a monetary value that they can pay for, and that's great. Here's number four, I am good enough and provide enough value to deserve to be paid for the service, okay? I am good enough and provide enough value, oh dear, um, to deserve to be paid for the service. Um, I don't know if it cut out there. So number four, in case it did, uh, I am good enough and provide enough value to deserve to be paid for this service, right? Um, you don't have to be the absolute end all best to be allowed in the space. You don't have to be, you know, Steve Jobs to be creating and selling an app. You don't have to be, um, you, you know what I'm saying? You don't have to be the best in the space. Um, think about it, there are multiple brands in every space, right? Um, for computers, there's Windows and Mac. For clothing, think how many boutiques there are just in like your neighborhood alone. Um, Italian restaurants, there's not just one Italian restaurant, there's a bajillion Italian restaurants. You don't have to be the absolute best, but you have to be yourself. They're allowed to be multiple providers that can charge money and do a good job. Um, so for example, um, maybe you're newer and you're starting out with newer rates and you're thinking no one's gonna hire me. Guess what? You may be perfect for someone who's starting out and needs someone at a lower rate who's still learning. That may make you perfect for them to get started. There are people out there that you can serve and give value to where they are. Same with, um, say you're transferring from a different specialty. Like for me, I went from bookkeeping to a copywriting business. Um, guess what? Um, I was in a niche. I was transferring from a different specialty, so that made me even better to serve a specific type of person, right? Um, I didn't have to be the very best but I had this background that positioned me to serve a certain type of people really well. And I deserve to be paid for this service, just like you deserve to be paid for yours. So that's number four, number five. The enjoyment or ease I feel in providing the service is not what the price is based on. This is also an important one for me. The enjoyment or ease I feel in providing the service is not what the price is based on. I'm not pricing, you know, if it's fun for me, sometimes I feel guilty paying. If it was easy or fast for me, sometimes I feel guilty charging. Um, you're not pricing things by how miserable they make you or how long it takes you. Think about how much time and effort and you put into getting good at what you do to make it fast. Like there's like a saying among, um, you know, painters and artists, it's just like, you're not paying me for the 10 minutes we need to paint this. You're paying me for, you know, the 15 years of experience, um, practice and education I went through to get to the point of making this. So it's the same kind of thing. You don't set a price by how miserable it makes you, how long it takes you, things like that. You're priced on how much value you give to someone else, how much you improve the lives of others, how much of a difference you make. So think about your pricing that way. Don't feel bad about charging or having a sales pitch just because like, well, I'm good at this, I like this, I would do it even without money, great. 
well then you can take it to the next level and have an extra level of excellence this way. So that was my five um, money or sales mindset anchors. I know that my services make a positive difference in the lives of others. There are people out there whose lives will be improved by what I have to offer. The positive difference I make has a monetary value that people expect and will pay for. I'm good enough and provide enough value to deserve to be paid for the service. The enjoyment or ease I feel in providing the service is not what the price is based on. Okay, so those are important things to keep in mind with this. So I do have three quick uh, sales tactics that you can add to your copy, specifically copywriting tactics. So first, why are we using tactics? I thought we were getting away from that, right? Well, here's the thing. The internet is noisy, and the noisiest people are always the best or service-oriented people. So you want to make sure that they get to someone who really cares about them. So you kind of have to figure out how to be strategic and noisy too, so that you can give them good service. I know you've seen it. You've seen people who are not as good as you getting paid more and more clients than you. So you kind of have to jump in the ring. Also, sometimes we need a helpful push to do what's good for us. You know, if we're not working out something to get our butt off the couch, you know what I mean? So sometimes we need to have these tactics to help them reach their goals, you know? If someone's overweight, of course they want to lose weight, but sometimes they need a little push to get them to the point of committing to it, you know what I'm saying? Um, and also sometimes we're not aware of how much better our lives could be on the other side, right? Um, so for example, you, you guys know that I've been married before. I had no idea what a happy relationship could really be like when I was in the middle of an unhappy one. It's really hard to, you want to help them understand how much better things could be because sometimes you just get used to where you are. So this is why we have strategies. We want to help them improve their lives and to understand how we can help them get there, that it actually will be an improvement. So anyways, that's why we have these tactics. Here's three of them. These are easy ones. One, make them feel safe. This is a really easy one. So for me, I have the content membership. Um, I promise a full refund for the first 30 days. If they join, they're not happy, money back straight away. No questions asked, no screwing around. Here's the thing, it makes them feel safe, so it makes them more likely to sign up. Here's another thing, um, most people won't use it. I've been offering this since day one for my membership for more than a year. I haven't had a single person do it. Now, that's not the case for everyone, and I'm sure there'll be a day where that does happen for some reason, but I would rather people feel safe and deal with that the few times it happens than to make people feel like it's too much of a risk. So make them feel safe. Free shipping and return, secure checkout process, make them feel safe, take away the risk. Another second one, offer them proof. This goes back to the whole being honest thing. Um, testimonials, results, when you're talking about if you've increased someone's revenue for a year, talk in specific dollars. And I mean $17,436.62. Specific sells, specific is authoritative. Give testimonials, give proof. This is another way that helps them feel safe about buying from you. Um, what your service has done, what it can do for others. Um, case studies of how you've done stuff. Show them what it has done. This is a really good way thing to pull into your content and it's easy. And the third thing to do is you tap into the FOMO. Um, urgency, scarcity, fear of missing out. Um, there's a discount until X date. Prices go up on X date. Offer bonuses included until X date. Only available until X date. Only X seats available. Things of that nature. Let them know that there is a time limit and a limitation to the, the availability. Now, again, I want to go back to, but isn't that icky and manipulative? You don't have to use all of them and they can all come from a specific good place. And I want to address that because again, this is important for me too. I need my sales to feel good. So as long as these, you know, going talking about this tapping into the FOMO thing, as long as what you're doing is honest, again, honest is a part of being a good, uh, a serving salesman, be honest. So here's where the honesty comes from. I want you to look at your business, your energy, your schedule, your availability, and your standards for what you're providing for your clients. This is where you can set honest limitations and then talk about it in your marketing. Um, so you don't have endless time. You know, I had a, I had a, a price hike that happened. Someone tried to come in late and so I let her in and it became a whole nightmare system-wise because the system had already changed. So late signups became harder to deal with, to honor um, as a result. So because of that, I now have time limits on certain, you know, like price increases and things like that. Um, 
And also, too many clients will burn you out. You don't want to have a million clients. So what's your limit on how much, how many clients can you serve with the time you have? You don't want to burn out because then you won't be able to serve at your top thing. So that's another part of it. Um, what levels are you able to maintain excellence at? Um, this is another way to reverse engineer. I only have X number of seats. Um, the price goes up at this time, things like that. Um, do you have, um, what levels, you know, can you only have three calls a day without completely burning out or can you do like 10? Um, that's a true limitation. Do you have a group that needs, you know, a group program that needs to be intimate in order to succeed? Okay, that's a true limitation. Um, are they in a specific place in their business that they need to be so that there's an exclusivity? If you're not at this financial point, this won't help you. Talk about that. It's okay. It's true. Or you can only give excellent service to X number of people with the hours you have. So what is your way of maintaining excellence? That's a natural barrier. Talk from it though. Um, and also, you're probably not charging enough. So when you do say prices are going up at this time, it is a great strategy. But guess what? The people who act on it, number one, you're helping them to move forward on something that's obviously a pain point or a goal they want to achieve. You are being honest. They're getting the same thing that's worth more for less money. Um, and guess what? You, you continually get better, increase your impact, become smarter. So when you, it's natural to raise your prices. So the, again, you don't have to be dishonest. Just evaluate um, your resources, your time, your, your level of standards in your business. And then you can craft a message around it to help motivate people to make the difference they want to have in their own lives. Okay, so that's what I have for now. I know it's a lot, but this is something I've <laughs> thought a lot about, struggled a lot about, and I hope that helps when it comes to selling in a way that feels good, isn't icky, and that you really feel like you're making a difference. Anyways, hope you have a good day. Um, I will see you next week, and just let me know if I can help with anything. All right, bye.